I'd like to, to welcome you all today um, and thank you for coming. Um, I would like um, to reiterate what Linda said and express our solidarity with the women of Ukraine and pay tribute to them for their courage, strength and determination in this particularly serious uh, crisis. Um, and as time is tight, I want to keep um, introductions to a minimum. We have with us three exceptional women, Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland, UN High Commissioner, former chancellor of this university, member of the elders, human rights lawyer activist. I, I could go on, but I won't. Um, Laura Adler, historian, journalist, presenter, biographer, and current presenter of Leur Bleu en France Inter, and Emilia Roig, founder and executive director of the Berlin-based Center for Intersectional Justice and author of the best-selling book, Why We Matter, The End of Oppression. So it's very, very good to meet you. I wish we were all here in person, but um, it's, it's great to have you online any way we can. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we have four broad areas of discussion. One is gender equality and economic recovery and the challenge of climate change. Another is sexual and reproductive health and rights um, and rule of law. Another is the fight against sexual and gender-based violence. And the uh, fourth is convergences between intersectional and universalist approaches to feminism. So what I thought we would do is that I um, start with Mary, if that's all right, um, with, with a question um, on environmentalism and feminism. Um, and then I invite Laura and Emilia if they would like to respond to what Mary says. Um, and if not, that's fine. I have lots of other questions that we can keep going. So, um, so I'll, I'll move first to, to you, Mary, because um, your work on climate changes is well known. Um, and I was wondering, do you see a convergence between feminist and environmental activism? It's a very... Interesting question, but I would like to begin by echoing uh, what has been said. You know, I have celebrated International Women's Day in so many different places over a long, long number of years. And I think this is one of the saddest because of those images coming out of Ukraine. We can't escape that reality. We just have to, uh, I think, renew our commitment um, in the face of uh, those images of women and young children and elderly people and handicapped people um, struggling to get out of being killed or wounded or having their homes destroyed. It is truly shocking and truly terrible. Having said that, I'm happy to answer your question in a very personal way. Uh, I came late to the issue of climate change. When I was president of Ireland, I didn't say anything about climate. I did speak about the environment, but climate wasn't hurting us in Ireland. We weren't aware of the problem in between 1990 and 1997. And then when I became high commissioner, um, another part of the UN was dealing with this problem. I was in a big silo on human rights and gender and et cetera. And um, the UNFCCC was dealing with climate. It was when I started working for a very small NGO I founded called Realizing Rights in African countries on the rights that matter if you don't have them, rights to food, water, health, education, shelter. And I was also honorary president of Oxfam. So I was traveling a lot in African countries and I couldn't believe in 2003, 2004, 2005, how appallingly affected the communities were. And of course, women and girls were much worse because their, their social role was different. They had less power and yet they had to put food on the table, go further and drought for water, et cetera. And then I went to my first conference, climate conference, which was Copenhagen in 2009. And I was shocked, literally shocked at how male and technical and scientific it was. Not a mention of human rights, not a mention of gender. So the following year in Cancun, together with Patricia Espinosa, and I'll be on a panel later today on gender and climate with Patricia, now in charge of the UNFCCC, but she was the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Mexico. And she and the three women who uh, she had, um, she was chairing Cancun, um, um, the chairs of Copenhagen and Durban were going to, were on the panel as well. We formed a network of women um, on a gender and climate. And the women involved were women ministers of environment, of energy, some of foreign affairs and the heads of UN agencies. And um, we began by um, you know, getting parity um, of, in the delegations and in committees. We got a new decision on that actually in Doha 
um, uh, under a male um, uh, president who was, who, was, who was frightened of all the women around him and, and who, who agreed to, the, to let this happen. And, and um, uh, um, Christiana Figueres, who was the then head of the UNFCCC, called it the miracle of Doha. But anyway, we got, and then afterwards, and this is an important issue, afterwards, um, we saw that these ministers had the power to decide who would be in their delegations. And from then on, they began to have grassroots women, indigenous women, young women, in their delegations. And I can tell you, because I was now talking about um, all the cops since Copenhagen up to now, um, that made a difference um, that was hard to quantify, hard to exaggerate, because you had um, Constance O'Kellett um, of Uganda speak in her dignified voice about what it was like to have her village destroyed. And these delegates um, listening, um, you know, because she had a delegate's badge now, because Ireland had included her in the delegation, um, uh, they would listen fascinated to the real life story of a frontline person affected. And these stories made a lot of difference. And we got gender, we got a gender action plan, and we moved on. From, and I think arising out of that, then you have the wonderful young, um, you know, Fridays for Future, Greta Thunberg, but there are millions like Greta, um, many, many variations, and they don't like to be identified as Greta, they, they like to be themselves, naturally. Um, and, and, and the the voices. I mean, I was I was recently with Shia Bastida, who's um, Mexican indigenous, uh, studying in the United States. She's one of the most incredible moral voices I've ever heard. If she was eligible, I'd make her an elder. That's <laughs> just to grow for a bit, you know, get older, and then. But um, but it's the power of these voices, the compelling truth to power, the um, the unequivocal. They're not going to be sidetracked or distracted or they, they, they don't like greenwashing and euphemisms, et cetera, and they hold us to account. And that's what's changed completely. And um, I think there has been a total coming together of a very exciting sort. Thank you very much. That sounds, I mean, that's um, so encouraging. Um, and I think it's, it's very interesting the way you, you talked about how the men in the room had such a different attitude um, and that um, the, the decision-making process could be enhanced by them then delegating and bringing women into, into the space, those women that were most directly affected by climate change. So, hmm. um, would um, either Emilia or Laure like to come in there? Um, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much. Uh, it was um, interesting listening to you. Um, I can start saying something about International Women's Day, and I think we need to shift a little bit the wording that we're using, um, especially because what we're intending to do is to fight a system, a system that has been inferiorizing and dehumanizing women for uh, many centuries. And I think we need to call it by its name. So I'm advocating here in Germany for uh, using the term anti-patriarchy day, um, because if we do that, we can rally uh, around this term. We can rally and, and uh, instead of focusing on an identity, right? Focusing on the female identity. We can expand it to all the people who are adversely affected by patriarchy as a system. So we're speaking about um, also members of the LGBTQI community. We're speaking about trans women. We're speaking about um, sex workers uh, across the globe who are the first and and um, yeah, the first victims of patriarchy, or at least some of the main victims of patriarchy. We can also include uh, in this category um, disabled women and queer people. And um, we can add as well black people, people of color, um, Jewish people, Muslim people, uh, especially um, you know, the ones who are um, uh, at least through their identities being socialized as women, um, bearing the cost, the, the highest cost of, uh, of um, patriarchy. And when we do that, we realize as well that we're speaking about the global working class and the global working class is gendered, right? So the global working class is overwhelmingly female. And this is something that we often forget or at least forget to mention, right? The global working class is female. The global working class is primarily as well um, from people from the global South. And if it's in the global North, um, composed of migrants, of people of color. And then it becomes very clear that we cannot combat patriarchy without also combating um, capitalist exploitation. We cannot combat patriarchy without combating um, racism. And we can close the, the, the circle and understand that environmental injustice is 
a, um, uh, a feminist issue, that en environmental injustice is also um, an issue that needs to be tackled from the angle of racism and um, capitalism. Thank you. Oh, terrific. Thank you, Anilia. Um, oui, oui, bonjour. Yes. Bonjour. Hello. I'm Laura Edler. I'm talking to you from Paris, and I'd like to respond to what you said, which I think is very important. And I'd like to ask a question. Uh, Mary Robinson talked earlier about, about the, the different movements of feminism. You talked about the possibility of expressing feminism in many different ways, depending on geographic origins or social origin, or even from different ideologies. And I think today we're at a, a watershed moment. Is feminism a moment of emancipation and liberation that affects the entire world? A movement that uh, is fighting for liberation of all those who have been oppressed, both uh, even the recent past? Or is feminism more of a revendication, uh, uh, soci sociological, uh, revendication against. We're trying to reduce uh, inequality as much as we possibly can between men and women, between to reduce patriarchalism as much as possible. That's something I would like to ask Mary Robinson based on her experience. Because if we're now a few years after Me Too, uh, I have personally feeling that we've moved on to a new level, a new definition of feminism. Well, first of all, I'm so sorry that I can't be physically together with both of you because I've read a lot about you both and it would be fun if we could be together. But I'm, I'm actually very struck by what you both said, and in particular, um, uh, Emilia, about uh, intersectionality. I first came across that at the uh, World Conference Against Racism, which I was the Secretary General of um, in 2002 in Durban, a tough conference, but we were constantly being reminded of the intersectionality of racism, um, being female, being black, being all, all the kind of um, intersectionality. Now I've learned so much more because I have a podcast and my podcast is called Mothers of Invention. And we've been doing it for a number of years. We have had three sessions. I started with a young Irish comedian, Maeve Higgins, who's a comedian in New York and quite successful. And it's funny because she's very funny and she's also half respectful of me on the podcast, which makes it even funnier. And yet we're very serious about climate. We um, have interviewed women in the global South and women in the South of the United States, listening to their stories. And every story is about patriarchy, about um, capitalism, about colonialism, about, you know, it's, it's really very interesting. No matter what part of the world, this is what comes through. So um, to answer you specifically, Laura, I do think uh, the Me Too movement, uh, all of these movements, the, the voices in climate, it's all connecting now in a way that wasn't true in the past. And these are, um, I think, let me put it this way, states of feminism that can respect each other rather than, uh, you know, and I think it will help, I hope, um, a lot of women who are reluctant to call themselves feminist. And um, I regret when women say to me, well, I, I don't like calling myself a feminist. I think that's such a loss because you have to be comfortable in your skin as a, as a feminist. And there are lots of ways which um, that is possible and more and more as we broaden um, the approach. Wonderful. Um, I wonder, um, it, perhaps um, given that the, um, the French embassy has been so instrumental in, in bringing this together, um, if we remember Fleur Dobon, the founder of ecofeminism um, and, she and people like um, uh, Vandana Shiva are arguing about replacing a politics of extractivism mm. and violence to the earth um, and a politics of um, increasing development in capitalistic modes of, of, of profiteering mm. and replacing that with a politics of care and vulnerability and acknowledging vulnerability. Um, and I wonder if, if you have, um, if you'd like to respond to that. Um, Yes, we've had Vandava, Vandava on our um, podcast, uh, giving a wonderful, um, uh, incredible account of how she, um, 
you know, uh, embraced trees and became this wonderful leader on regeneration, on uh, the soil, on seeds, etc. And I think, uh, I think we do need to bring the whole climate discussion much closer to uh, uh, the loss of biodiversity, the extinction of species, etc. And I personally have become increasingly supportive of the work of Johan Rockström in the Potsdam Institute on planetary boundaries. Um, I find, you know, um, that's now to me the, the framing that, that we need. And within that, um, of course, to be as regenerative, as renewing, as nurturing as possible. Thank you. Um, I might go to, to Laura next, um, because I, I know that there is a, a time constraint um, with you. And I wonder if you wanted to come in on that and then I'll come to Amelia. I think uh, that one of the most essential questions today is the fact that in 2022, because it seems like this is supposed to be our day today, should be every day our day, the, the day of, of women's day should be every day. It shouldn't be something we just have one day, it should be every day in our fight to for recognition and equality. I really have the impression that, as you noted earlier, there has been the historic feminist movement. And if we look at uh, the wake of that in France, and particularly in France in 1968 and in 1970, there was a full generation of feminists in France starting in the 1970s, which I was a part of. And then if we look at our own daughters, they had the idea that uh, feminism was kind of a has-been, something they thought, and that women's rights had already been acquired. But today, it is the youngest amongst us who are showing us the way since the Me Too revolution. And I want to press that word revolution. The question is historical, it's political and rhetorical. When I talk about political, what I mean is, is feminism as it was defined in the past sufficient? Can feminism be a worldwide movement? For example, a movement for peace. And I just like to point out that if we look at the tragedy in Ukraine that we're living through today, the women are suffering there. And plus in Germany and in France, we should remember that in 1914, women from France and Germany met just before the First World War, they met in order to say no to the war. Unfortunately, these uh, manifestations didn't have any effect, but there were, uh, there were people who met and spoke out about peace before World War I. And I think it's important to mention that today. And if we look now in 2022, the question I'm wondering is why here in Europe and why in my own country, in France, why do not men and women who have the same skills have the same salary? Why are there so few women who have uh, who are responsible in political roles and even less and less? And uh, the people in charge, the politicians today, uh, women are definitely in the minority. And if we look in the business world, there is an extreme minority of women in important positions. If we look in the presidential elections, Women who take any risks are often treated poorly by their uh, colleagues. And what worries me the most is that in feminism, we have to think about the poorest women who are affected by uh, uh, gender bias, the fra most fragile amongst us. In France, for example, it is poorest women who have the hardest uh, times because they don't have the right to have uh, long-term contracts, which means they aren't protected by the law, they aren't protected by the labor code, which means they have to have a whole series of short-term contracts, which means they won't have a very good retirement or no retirement at all or pension at all. If we talk about them socially, they live in single parent families, which is kind of a euphemism because it's always almost always the father who has left. And these are women who are raising their children alone with extremely low salaries. So ecofeminism 
is one of the many different problems of the important problems that we are tackling. It's very important, ecofeminism. But I think in today's feminism, we have to have a globalized uh, fight together. We shouldn't have, it shouldn't be placed in silos. We should all work together. And I'd like to know what you think about that. Um, I, yeah, I, I very much agree, um, uh, Laura. And I think, you know, your point is very well made about um, women um, as workers and as the majority of working classes, um, as Amelia said, um, uh, were very, very affected also by COVID. Uh, COVID had a very damaging effect on women's uh, steps in any country to make progress. They were pushed back because they were in jobs that were suddenly closed in hospitality and various other areas. Um, they had to go take um, uh, care of children when schools were closed, uh, everything. And then the um, rise in domestic violence um, in every country, including here in Ireland, has been you know, really very, very worrying and very evident. And the mental health problems, um, very worrying. So I, I, I agree with you, and I would just add um, the recent problems of COVID. Amelia, would you like to come in there? Yes, absolutely. So um, I think it's really important. First of all, before anything, I'd like to come back on uh, something um, that you said about a lot of women refraining from using the term or having a difficulty um, identifying as feminists. And I think this is really um, rooted in internalized misogyny where women have learned to um, devalue anything that is um, feminine, female, or um, their women identity. In a pa patriarchal world, this is what young girls are taught and this is what we carry with us. So it means part of feminism is also to reclaim um, our identity and to put ourselves on an equal footage, to realize that standing by this female identity is something that we can do in order to advance um, equal rights for women and in order to stand for ourselves and for other women. So that was the first thing I wanted to say because we need to do this inner work. We need to do some collective uh, work of, um, um, empowerment and so it's it, I think the word empowerment has lost a lot of its meaning because it's been misused but really what it's about is to cultivate self-love and to cultivate um, um, yeah this self-esteem then um, second concerning um, gender inequality I think there is an aspect that remains um, largely overlooked or I think that is uncomfortable and we need to confront it and the discomfort that comes with it um, is I think very key into solving a lot of the um, injustice facing women uh, across the world. And it has to do with intimate relationships. It has to do with the laws and policies which continue to cement the um, economic and political dependency of women. So there is in my mind a pressing need to reform marriage as an institution in order to understand the history of marriage, to understand the laws behind it that have um, created a form of um, economic dependency of women towards their husbands. And, and here I'd like to pose and really say that it doesn't have much to do with um, how men are socialized, but it has a lot to do with an institution that is forcing these behaviors upon people, right? So if I give you an example, it could be very well uh, the case that we have a husband that wants to have an egalitarian marriage that is all for gender equality, but because policies and laws are pushing him into the main breadwinner, um, a, a skewed economic um, dynamic is going to become more and more salient in this relationship as children also come along. And I'm speaking about this because gender equality on the labor market, the higher participation of women in politics will be to a certain extent dependent on the ways in which intimate relationships are organized and the ways in which the state is also playing a role in, um, in, in structuring this inequality. So that's why I think we need to pay more attention to the institutions and to the laws and policies that are, um, that are intervening in the ways in which we structure our relationships. Um, marriage is an example, but of course you have other laws that are attached to marriage, such as policy, uh, social policy, family policies, labor market laws as well. We see that um, in- Les violences conjugales, 
les lois contre les violences conjugales très importantes. Also domestic violence is also important, which Mary Robinson talked about earlier. We're way behind here in France compared with Spain, for example. That's unacceptable. That have so many women being killed. It's just impossible. It's just something I can't accept. The law needs to protect women more. Yeah, and currently the law is um, doing the opposite. And so we take the law as an unchangeable, um, an unchangeable aspect of our societies. Um, and I think it's time to, to tackle it. We cannot tackle gender, in, gender inequality on the labor market without tackling marriage laws because they're intimately related to each other. One of the things that um, uh, happened in Ireland when we joined the European Union was being able to use the laws of the EU um, and in particular in our social welfare code. Uh, I was able as a barrister at the time in, in the courts um, not just in the Irish court, but with reference to the European court, which was very helpful, um, to uh, show that um, having um, discrimination against married women in, in unemployment benefit and other benefits um, was not compatible with EU law. And that was a huge you know, wedge we, we opened up um, at the time. Um, but I agree with you, um, uh, and I, I, I think you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it, there's a constant need to, you know, to, to struggle to remove um, barriers, laws, impediments. Um, we had the Generation Equality Forum, um, which was hosted, of course, by Mexico and Paris during last year. Um, I, one of the things I was very pleased about was that one of the streams was um, feminist climate justice. Um, that was, you know, I, I, I had a little to do with that being one of the areas that we were focusing on. But, um, uh, you know, the fact that we could have in Ireland, you know, a referendum on um, the uh, equality in marriage um, was, was really important. And I think it has, it, has, it has had an impact on young people in this country because they were responsible. They were the ones that really campaigned for this. And it, it, has, um, it has changed how we see ourselves a little bit. So all of this, I agree, we remove the impediments and the barriers and, they, and we feel actually, we breathe in a different way in some sense. I wonder, um, one, one thing seems to be that the, um, as Amelia was saying, the, the laws appear to be so static. Is there any way that feminism can make law and institutional policies more dynamic? Well, um, laws reflect, um, uh, in a sense, the policy and culture of the time, but they, they are rather static. It's harder to change them. I mean, um, you know, uh, I remember in my time as a senator, we were focused on changing the law on rape because it was, it's still not adequate. It's still not. Um, I mean, the, the, um, those who, um, you know, suffer rape or sexual harassment and, and go to court about it find themselves a double victim. We know that. Um, even now, um, it, it, it's still, uh, it's, it's difficult and it, it, it will help as we have more women, um, judges, women, um, prosecutors, women uh, at all sorts of levels. Women, you know, um, and uh, that is, you know, it's happening more and more, but it's not happening enough globally either. I mean, I, I tend to have more of a global than, a, uh, than even a European perspective, um, having, having served as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. I can never um, constrain myself. I have to keep looking at, you know, thinking of women in Uganda, thinking of women in uh, Vietnam, thinking, you know, um, their position. And, uh, and that's why um, I, I think the very way we're talking about um, states of feminism is really important because that also helps women from different cultural perspectives to make those steps forward in their culture. Um, and, and that's what's important. I think um, the, the structural inequalities that Emilia um, is talking about, it seems to be um, so... I mean, the, the ways in which these, these structures um, work seem to be so impenetrable. Um, and the way in which you were talking about marriage um, and the you know, um, access to the labor market and so on, um, how, how do women actually um, progress to get their voices heard, to, to actually be the ones that can um, implement changes in, for instance, rape law or um, marriage law, or so on. Um, and I think you know, may, perhaps we might move um, 
more formally now to uh, the fight against sexual and gender-based violence um, on, on that note. Um, in Britain, uh, the Labour MP Jess Phillips um, reads out the names of women murdered every year. Um, and it's, it's, it's just, just continuously horrifying. I mean, that's only a tiny fragment of, of the, the um, victims of gender-based violence that we know about. Um, how, can we, how can we reform this culture? Well, one of the things that um, we've insisted on in the elders is that men have to speak out against yes. violence against women of all kinds. And in, in fact, um, uh, Jimmy Carter, when he was active with us, he's now retired, but he's still interested in our work. Um, uh, Juan Manuel Santos, um, uh, the former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, all of them champion um, as men tackling violence against women and we have to educate boys we have to you know we have to look at masculinity i'm sure amelia would have quite a lot to say on that and i'd love to hear you yes i think um <laughs> yeah i mean it's i think it's it's a situation where we need to uh if i'd like to i'd like to come back to the whole conversation because there's so many ideas and so many things uh that come to our minds um and one subject that is really dear to my heart is the topic of intersectionality, as you know. Um, and so intersectionality describes um, very simply the understanding and tackling of inequalities and injustice in its full depth, right? So it means that instead of looking, and this is essentially what I said at the beginning, instead of looking at the category women and, and seeing it as a homogeneous um, category, understanding that there are so many other aspects of identities that lead to discrimination and oppression. And in order to do so, um, we need to be courageous and understand that a lot of our institutions will need to be reformed or abolished for some of them. And so that's a thought that appears to be very radical and, uh, and almost impossible to follow, right? So something that seems impossible to sustain as a thought. But we need to realize that utopian thinking and utopian visions have brought us here, right? It means that for a long time, um, having a society where slavery is not the main economic, political, and cultural system used to be utopian. The fact that women someday can vote used to be utopian. The fact that two women or two men can have children and found a family and marry used to be utopian. So I think we need more courage. We need more uh, we need to be more assertive in our demands of what a feminist world should look like. And if we continue to try to fit ourselves into frames that already exist, and those frames being built on the backs of women, those frames be being built to control and oppress women, we're lost. We're not going to win, right? And so, and also something else that I want to say about winning against patriarchy, this is not a zero sum game, right? It's not a zero sum game. And very often, a lot of people feel threatened by feminism because they associate with feminism a reversal of oppression, thinking that if we get more rights for women, it means less right, fewer rights for men. If we mean more visibility for women, it means less visibility for men. This is not what it is, right? The fight for um, justice and uh, equality is, a, is expansive. It means that liberation for women means liberation for men too. Because men under patriarchy are also, I mean, they do benefit from the system in material sense, but they have a high price to pay, especially in childhood, to conform to this uh, masculine um, or toxic, toxic masculine uh, ideal that is so central to patriarchy. So this is what we need to, to understand. So utopian thinking and being more assertive, being more radical in our claims and demands and understanding that the end of oppression is not a zero sum game. We will all benefit from it. It's not about reversing oppression. It's not about reversing inequality. It's much more than that. It's something that goes beyond we can, what we can imagine. Thank you. Laura. Laura. Je voudrais renforcer uh, vos propos. I would just like to support what you said which I think is what you said is very important because I think we, as women, we are very, very too nice. We're a little bit too patient. And if we continue to be so patient, it's our great grandchildren 
in a hundred years from now, talking by Zoom or WhatsApp, we'll continue to say, have to have these same conversations to try to have our, the rights of women respected. So I think there was an acceleration that we got from Me Too, it's worldwide. And it's also helped by technical things such as social networks. We need to take advantage of all the different possibilities to make this as con contagious as possible, freedom of women. And I think what uh, Martha also said was very interesting. It's not a war between the sexes. It's a war for a new definition of our humanity. I think men have just as much to win in this as women. It's not, it's not a fight of women for women. We need men, of course. And the last thing is I think what also what Martha said is very interesting. And I think Mary Robinson also said it earlier is that one of the, the most necessary and vital means is education. Education starting right when children at the youngest age in elementary school so that we don't perpetuate this patriarchal model unconsciously and consciously. I, I want to come in on, uh, you know, the fact that I think the Me Too movement and, you know, young climate activists, they are not accepting the norm now. And, and that is really good. They are standing up. They are insisting. They are angry. And they, they can't believe that in the 21st century, we still have this harassment, violence against women, etc. cetera, that um, we're not seeing uh, the, the, the moves we should be seeing on climate, the truth to power. And um, I just want to uh, share um, the way in which in our Mothers of Invention, we have a byline that says that climate change is a man-made problem and requires a feminist solution. And I always explain that man-made is generic. We're all responsible. Yes, maybe men have more power and are more responsible and um, do more emissions, but we're all, we all have a, a, a part to play. And um, as many men as possible must adopt the feminist solution, which leads on to what do you mean by a feminist way of doing? And I think we should talk about that more. That, you know, to me, it's what came out of the women's movement. It's problem solving. It's non-hierarchical. It's listening. And it is tackling the fundamentals that we've been talking about, the fundamentals of patriarchy, the fundamentals of a, a sort of rampant capitalism that has led to such inequality in our world and, and so on. Um, Emilia, I think, wanted to get in there as well. Uh, Emilia? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's, there's one thing that I think we need to also clarify when we say that we need men in feminism. Um, because, of course, we need to all come forward together. We need to all fight together. But I see a pattern that is being repeated and that also comes back to um, a lot of women who refuse to see themselves or call themselves feminists. And it has to do with trying to water down feminist claims to make them acceptable to the majority of men. And this is a problem because if we do that, we lose sight of what we want to achieve. And at the time, it means that, or if we look at the, 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 the suffrage um, campaigns at the beginning of the century, we can see that uh, those campaigns were marked by tremendous conflict it means that suffragettes were being demonized in the press, in the media, uh, by men generally, and that they, they stood by what they wanted, right? So it means that suffragettes at the time were not afraid of conflict because they knew that this level of friction is absolutely necessary for any social progress. Social progress never happens out, out of um, a, a, a mild consensus. It doesn't. It, it occurs through friction, through conflict. And, um, and I think we need to have a certain, um, we, need, we need to be able to, um, to, to, to accept uh, a certain level of conflict. And of course, violence is not the key and we don't want violence, right? I wanna make that clear. But uh, wanting compromise and consensus at all costs is not serving um, the cause of social justice. It's not serving the cause of um, gender justice, of intersectional justice, of racial justice. We need to be sure that um, 
there, th this level of friction is a necessary um, ingredient of social change. Yes, that's um, very interesting. And I think um, very true, but I think that the um, things like um, men can be feminists. I think this is something that, you know, when you were talking about intersectionality, Emilia, um, that feminist is not necessarily a gendered term um, that you know, men and women can be feminists and I think um, rise up against these capitalist patriarchal structures that confine us all. Um, and um, I'm anxious to go to law because I know you have to leave soon, um, unfortunately. Um, and law, you um, famously um, did not sign that letter um, in the French press that Catherine Deneuve and a number of other um, French celebrities signed um, about the Me Too campaign um, that wanted to give men some license to um, importune or to, to flirt. Um, and I, I think it, that was, uh, that was, it was very interesting that that letter to, um, I think, to a non-French person anyway, could exist. Um, I wonder if you could maybe, sorry about that. <laughs> so I just wondered if you perhaps talk a little bit about, um, you know, French, French feminism and, and some uh, French attitudes towards sexuality and uh, sexual justice. Alors, euh, donc à cette répercussion sur le plan international. Alors d'abord, so, did have repercussions internationally. The first thing I'd want to say is not just for me, but for me, Catherine Deneuve is a feminist. She's shown it many times in the past. She's been very courageous. Uh, at different times when concerning laws about abortion, which uh, Simone Veil led so wonderfully here. She demonstrated, she signed the manifesto that we had, which was the 343 uh, bitches, you might say, which might say that she had had an abortion. Uh, she was always there to defend women's rights. She's available. She doesn't hide behind anything. She's a full on feminist. Getting back to the, to the petition, which was from women from a very uh, favored uh, socially, I think it was kind of uh, awkward. Uh, I didn't talk directly with her about it, but uh, I don't think maybe she really understood the argument behind that petition, which basically said that in any case, feminism as we understand it would be to abandon femininity would be to abandon our uh, our own abilities as women to distinguish ourselves from the other sex, which could lead one to believe that we wouldn't have the possibility, as we mentioned earlier, to flirt or to be a, to try to seduce men. But I think that's a very bad definition of feminism, which had very bad effects but which did lead to uh, a positive reaction from masochists who rubbed their hands saying, ah, great, there's a, a lack of cohesion between women. And right now, at the moment now, as we're talking, I think that consensus has now been established. Feminists from different generations all agree that the most fundamental rights and the legislative work to be done to protect women, both physically Again, here I'm talking again, talking about, I'm talking in particular about domestic violence. Also laws for women who are the most precarious positions in society who are the poorest need further protection by the law as well. And the possibility for the youngest generations to be actors, completely actors, empowered activists in the best sense of the term, getting back to environmental activists as well. Because Mary Robinson talked about that earlier. She talked about her generation and mine, because we belong to the same generation. We didn't know about how urgent the climatic change was. And even if intellectually we were committed to recognition of the rights of women and of the poorest people, uh, the decolonized countries, we were part of those battles as well. But we didn't know at that time how urgent 
uh, it was to protect our planet. And I'm very happy now that our, the youngest generations have joined our feminist uh, struggle uh, and have joined it with uh, environmental issues because I personally believe that it is the young people today who we have to count on, who are the most important and who are going to maybe create a more globalized movement and a more joyous movement than maybe our movement was uh, in our generation. Thank you. I think um, I, I, I love the word use of uh, the word joyous there, and I think it, it chimes in with Emilia's use of the word utopian. Um, and I think that that comes together very well. And um, speaking about, um, you know, yes, Catherine Deneuve is, of course, a feminist. And I think that it's interesting to think about the puritanical way in which we can sometimes condemn other women for not being feminist enough or not being the right kind of feminist. And I think that now more than ever, we, we have to join together. We have to um, acknowledge differences in the way we see feminism, femininity, women, um, and come together because the challenges we are facing are just so great. Um, yes, Mary. If I could just come in um, on, you know, where we are in the world today, um, in a way, if it wasn't for that terrible uh, invasion of Ukraine and what's happening there, a lot of our focus would have been on what happened um, um, on Monday of last week, the report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I think we would have woven much more of that. And that is telling us we don't have a safe future. Yeah. Um, that is actually very galvanizing. It's very, you know, it's very important that we kind of factor in that we have to change dramatically from this um, world that um, we have um, you know, inherited, if you like, from structures that have been very paternalistic, very and um, very dependent on you know, colonialism, capitalism, et cetera. And we have to change. And then the war itself, especially in Europe, um, we have to change to clean energy to get out of this dependence on Russian oil and gas. We have to do it incredibly fast. And all of this is perhaps helping us to be more ambitious as Amelia is saying, to, to, you know, to, to really understand that actually to have a future, uh, we have to have our voices much stronger on the need to address um, you know, production, consumption, supply chains, the whole gamut of, um, of, of our world at the moment, uh, because um, it's not working. And the fossil fuel industry is still far too powerful. And we have to get out of it. And, you know, so, you know, and, and that's why I welcome the fact that in the young climate voices, women, young women, young girls are so powerful in what they're saying, because I think that's helping uh, to make it um, a feminist cause as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think um, I would like to come to some of the, the um, achievements that were made by second wave feminists. Um, you know, the, the, um, if we move to things like sexual and reproductive health and rights, um, young women today can you know, enjoy much uh, freer access to contraception, to abortion, um, to, um, to decent healthcare in, in the European Union, but not, not everywhere in the European Union. Um, and I wonder if there is um, a case to be made for a European, um, a European focus on uh, abortion as a European human right. Personally, um, having seen how the debate unfolded in this country and admiring so much um, the way in which young people made it a human rights cause, I think uh, it probably is necessary to let countries um, uh, fight that battle um, themselves within their culture, um, you know, deeply. Um, it's not always um, progress either. <laughs> Look what's happening in Texas. Things are just literally going backwards in a terrible way. So. You know, but um, I, I think uh, to try a top-down European way probably would not help the cause. In fact, it might alienate it. Sure. You know, it might. might um, but um, uh, I, I'd like to hear what my two colleagues would like to say. It's 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 hard to do this, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> With the Zoom and the, the physical. So I, I want to hear more and more of you two. <laughs> um. I think I have something to say about abortion um, because we need to 
include it in a larger framework, understand what it actually means, right? Because the bodies of women have been instrumentalized by the nation state and by uh, our capitalist system as the you know the bodies that are reproducing the workforce, the bodies that are reproducing the national population, uh, also in racial terms. And I think that uh, the 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 fact that we're going backwards when it comes to uh, reproduction rights and especially to abortion has a lot to do with the fear of replacement, the great fear of replacement that a lot of um, um, right wing populist movements. Um, face at the moment, or at least they, these are irrational fears, because if humanity extinguishes, all of us extinguish, and, you know, races, human races do not exist anyways, right? But there continues to have to be a discourse of, we need to have more babies in our nations to avoid being replaced by um, Black people, by Indigenous people, by uh, migrants, and this rhetoric is quite... Um, I would say quite pre prevalent. And so we can't ignore it. There was a very interesting documentary uh, made by Arte on this topic, trying to understand the, you know, the, 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 the discourse behind the anti-abortion um, movement. And so if we link it, we can understand that preventing abortion means reappropriating the bodies of women and really um, so that the, the bodies of women belong to the nation, so that they belong to the nation and can reproduce uh, a would-be race that actually doesn't exist. And so it seems far away, but I think this underlying discourse of, um, you know, even, even coming to a eugenic lens and thinking that some genes are better and needs to be, need to be reproduced and other genes are inferior and need to be, uh, um, uh, need to be prevented from reproducing is quite central to this debate. So it's not only a feminist issue, it's also very much an issue that is tied to um, century long eugenic discourses. We can see the, the discourse that is very reminiscent to um, the forced sterilizations that happened in the Third Reich and the ways in which the body of Aryan women was instrumentalized by uh, the Nazi regime. Yes, indeed. Um, Laura, can would, would you? No, like to... je suis totalement d'accord avec Emilia. I completely agree with Emilia. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave now because I have a radio show that's going to start. I wanted to just say once again how this uh, drama in Ukraine uh, concerns us as well, women, all its women involved in feminism, and these terrible images that we keep seeing over and over on TV uh, really show us that uh, the feminist movement can help us to get through this tragedy, can help us to give our support and our solidarity. And I think um, let them know that they're in the same situation, that each of us individually has been very affected by the situation because these are the values of the West, of the Western Europe uh, that are in, in question now. And the humanism that we thought we had acquired in a peaceful world uh, had been acquired and, and we still have work to do. And so I would like the, the special day today for women uh, is even more important at such a difficult time in Europe and is important for in Europe and also on a humanistic level. Thank you very much. And it's been wonderful to have you here, Laura. Um, and uh, thank you so much for your contribution. Perhaps we could round of applause. C'est moi qui vous remercie beaucoup. Merci. Um, I think we'll now move uh, to some student questions, um, if, that's, if that's all right for, for both Mary and for Emilia. Um, so, uh, you have the, the mic. Hi. If you could introduce yourself at the same time and yeah. the university you're from. Perfect. Um, my name is Kate Goodman. I'm the deputy president in DCU Students Union. I'm really honored to be here. Um, I've actually changed my question listening to everything you've been saying. Um, so I was just thinking about how we're talking about feminism and just the mis um, understanding of what that word means, especially to men, and again, talking about education and how important it is um, 
we teach children from the get-go um, about feminism um, and I just thought about the prevalence of single sex schools in Ireland and I wondered if I could get your opinion if that does foster unhealthy um, gender-based norms within Ireland and the EU. Um. I'm not quite sure what your question okay. is. <laughs> yeah, I just want to know if you think how, you know, in Ireland it's very prevalent that a lot of schools are single sexed and do you believe? Oh, it's, it's go, it's go, single sex schools, yeah. sorry, yes, I, I missed that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, for what it's worth, um, you know, when I was making the choice for R3, they went to um, um, mixed schools, you know, because I, I, I felt from, from the beginning it, it, it is really important. I know it's, it's said that girls prosper more in um, single sex um, schools, uh, but uh, it, it actually perpetuates a kind of divide that we're trying to get rid of. Um, so I, I think possibly the best in the, in the, in the, in the immediate term is, is that there is a choice, and that choice is opening up. I'm glad to see that schools are now seeing that. Um, children, uh, parents should be able with their children to have a choice of um, uh, at least, and, and I think we, we need to be moving to educate together. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Amelia, do you have, um, uh, I, I don't know what this, this school system is like in Germany um, as yes. to whether you have single sex or? No, no, so I mean, uh, certainly there are, but the, the, the mainstream school system is mixed. Um, and um, I, I see, that I find it a good thing. I'm, I'm not for, um, you know, separation of genders in school uh, because they also cement the idea that, um, they, they cement two things. They cement, first of all, uh, heterosexuality as the norm, saying that, you know, if children of opposite sex are going to come together, then automatically they, you know, there will be um, relations coming out of that. So first of all, it, you know, it's a way too early sexualization of children. Um, and then second, what I see is that in mixed schools, there are gender dynamics that are being replicated and that are highly problematic, but that can be tackled. Right. So I see that in the age of my own son, who's seven years old, and I see that there are a lot of patterns replicating rape culture taking place as early as six and seven years old, where, for example, a lot of um, boys want to kiss girls without their consent or where they are uh, occupying their space. And, 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 and really, um, you know, these dynamics are, are, are very disturbing. And I see that I have experienced them as a child, too. So now is the time where we should stop normalizing such behavior as normal child's development and understanding that um, a lot of these dynamics that are at play in schools can be a tremendous opportunity, uh, a great opportunity to tackle them, to unlearn this behavior, to confront it, to understand, for example, that um, as early as, uh, yeah, the very early years of, develop of child's development, boys occupy a lot more space in the playground for example, by playing football or soccer or um, by being a little bit rough. And then girls learn to walk around that. They learn to occupy less space. This is just but one example of how we can use this opportunity to confront the impact of patriarchy on our children. Thank you so much. Hello, uh, my name is Luke Buckley. I'm the VP for Welfare and Equality in Minute Students Union. Uh, I wanted to echo uh, really what Amelia said earlier about the, the strive for intersectionality uh, in ecofeminism. And uh, I want to know what uh, both your opinions on uh, how us as students can uh, join in in the, 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 the revolution against cl the cl climate change mm. and how we can, uh, like Amelia was saying, like uh, how we can combat anti-patriarchal uh, uh, modes, mm. I guess, in the world. Mm. Well, thank you for the question. I'll start and then I'm very interested in what Amelia will say as well. Um, this is your generation, this is your time, and it's a short time. And uh, we have to make an enormous change before 2030. That's less than eight years away. I mean, if ever there was a time when you have to step up and insist on being not just at the table, but actually driving and driving it in the right direction, in the direction we're talking about. So, um, you know, the, the urgency is such, and that's why it is so important 
that there is a kind of coming together of Black Lives Matter, of Me Too, of um, uh, the Fr Fridays for Future, um, the kind of different movements. And that helps the intersectionality. It helps us to see that these things are connected and that, you know, um, if you're uh, black and poor and disabled, you know, you have multiple problems, you don't, you know, and, and, and if you're gay and, if, you know, trans, um, all of these things um, are layers of potential barriers and discrimination. So uh, the more we can connect, but actually, um, I really feel it's, it's, it's such an important time now um, that uh, we have to step up and uh, address the fact that we're not on course and hold um, uh, governments, um, uh, governments made commitments. Let me give you an example. Um, adaptation is very important now in countries that are um, very vulnerable. And there are a lot of countries, as we saw in the IPCC report, very vulnerable to climate change. In the rich world, we have insurance. We can more or less cope even with um, problems like flooding in, Ber in Germany recently, like um, you know, uh, fires in California, et cetera, or in, in Australia. But poorer countries, our poorer small islands can be wiped completely. They need adaptation. They actually need loss and damage more and more. In the COP in Glasgow, uh, there was a promise to double adaptation finance by 2025, and there is no plan. No one is behind it. No one is driving it. So young people have to kind of get at the hypocrisy that's going on and, and the lack of implementation of commitments. And then the big emitters get the fossil fuel lobby. I mean, I just signed a letter today um, with a number of other academics that um, universities should not take money from fo the fossil fuel lobby for research, period. And, you know, we need a lot of things like that. And I, I, I really like your question because I know you know the answer. You have to step up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Amelia. Yeah, um, thank you for this answer. Um, well, I would say there are so many things that we can do to combat climate, uh, the climate crisis, the environmental crisis. Um, and so there are very, very concrete things that we can do, but I'd like to go on a bit of more um, meta level because I think this meta level is also so crucial in, you know, keeping track of what we of where we want to go. And there's a first thing and that's uh, deconstructing the hierarchy that exists between humans and nature. And that's this hierarchy between human and nature is also deeply linked to the hierarchy that exists between human beings. Right. And so in order for us to cut with this hierarchy, we need to confront um, the fact that um, human beings have been constructed as superior. And in some um, in some spheres of the environmental movement, we continue to invest in this hierarchy, representing nature as being in need of protection. Right. We continue to represent nature as in some in some instance, um, you know, a paternalistic uh, uh, approach to uh, environmentalism. I think we need to protect nature. We need to, you know, change. And for example, it also corroborates with um, uh, eco-fascism. And I was speaking about reproductive justice earlier and saying that overpopulation is the main reason for the environmental crisis and that we need to curb uh, um, birth rates in some parts of the world only, of course, right? Um, and so this idea that um, nature can be tamed, nature can be protected is the wrong way to go because nature is so much more powerful than we are, right? It means that what is at stake currently is our survival as the human species, but nature will regenerate. Let's imagine a scenario which we of course don't want to happen, but if humanity was to be wiped off the, the earth um, in I don't know, one decade, two decades, three decades, I don't know, I'm not a scientist, uh, um, I'm not a biologist, but probably nature would recover. So we need to step out of this hierarchy and understand that what we need to do um, in order to combat the environmental crisis is also to undo all the hierarchies that have brought us there in the first place, that have placed um, um, certain humans about others, but that have placed humanity above nature and most importantly, profits and money above anything else. We need to deconstruct as well money and understand that money is a construct. Money is an illusion. And it's an illusion that is so powerful that it kills the majority of people on the earth, right? The main reason why humans die is tied to money, right? So um, these are the things that we need to do in the long term. And I, as I promised, it was a very meta level, but we cannot afford to 
um, to stay at a very pragmatic level. We also need to have this broader view and understand where, um, where this environmental crisis is coming. I agree very much with Amelia, and I think we have to listen to indigenous peoples. Um, you know, I've learned so much. They see themselves as being part of and linked to Absolutely. and dependent on and nurturing with and so on. It's, it, it, it's one. And that is the mentality we need to have as well. I couldn't agree more. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, actually, uh, about this, there was a podcast today for the German speakers um, uh, in, in this audience, uh, a podcast exactly on this topic for uh, International Women's Day. So it's I will put it on my Instagram profile. The name is, um, yeah, it's my name, Emilia Roig. And uh, for the German speakers, it can be interesting. It was uh, Luisa Neubauer, who is... Um, a prominent environmental uh, activist, environmental justice activist here in Germany. Hi, I, my name is Roshi McGraw. I'm the vice auditor of the NUI Galway Feminist Society. And my question is based around, it's um, well established that women, girls and marginalized gender communities are disproportionately affected by sexual and gender-based violence in armed conflict situations. Um, so I was wondering, what do the panel think that the European community can and should do um, to ensure that international human rights and humanitarian laws are respected uh, during the armed conflict in Ukraine? It's a very good question and a very hard question because uh, we're seeing less and less respect. Um, you know, look at the failure to have um, uh, corridors, humanitarian, and then the cynicism, the corridors would only lead into Russia for the Ukrainian um, women and children and, you know, exactly that group that you're talking about to try to flee killing and, um, you know, appalling uh, inhumanity. Um, so uh, I, I, I would agree very much with you. And I, I, I think you know, it's, it's, it's getting away from the actual awful reality of Ukraine to make the point I'm making. But when I was appointed as the special envoy um, of the Secretary General, the UN Secretary General for the Great Lakes in Africa, um, Ban Ki-moon told me that I, I, I was the most senior mediator in the UN system. And I felt a responsibility to particularly focus on women and girls. And that was in, you know, in the DRC, in Rwanda, in Uganda, etc. I can't tell you how hard it was. All of the heads of state that I was dealing with were men. They appointed a technical committee of all men. I got um, uh, Binta Diop, who had a mandate as the special envoy of the, the African Union Commission on Women, Peace and Security Issues to be part of that technical committee. One woman, you know, not a token, because Binta would never be a token. But, uh, and, you know, so we're up against so many barriers and that will be the case too in, um, uh, in, in, in Ukraine, and all we can do is try to make sure that the voices are heard, that women are at the table when decisions are taken, that, you know, that there is a recognition um, of uh, the need to, um, to particularly protect, um, because also um, that, that route, those, that, you know, trying to get out of Ukraine can also be very hazardous, as we know. So, um, you know, it, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be very grim over the over the over the next while, and it will be worst for uh, that very group that you that you mentioned. And I, I'd love to hear Amelia on that as well. Sorry, the connection was quickly uh, fading. So, I, could you please, uh, at the moment when you were speaking, so I was trying to make sense of the question through the answer, and I have many ideas, but could you please, in, <laughs> very briefly, um, repeat your question? Yeah, of course. Um, so women, girls, and marginalized gender communities are disproportionately affected by um, sexual and gender-based conflict during armed conflict. Um, and I was just wondering if you had any views on what the European community should be doing to ensure that uh, international human rights and humanitarian laws are um, upheld. Yes, so again, we come to a very concrete answer, and I think it was already um, uh, answered, and I'd like to um, give the other level uh, that I like to develop very much, and that has to do with the representation, or at least the instrumentalization of women's bodies, or seeing women's bodies as a battlefield, 
And it will be the case as long as women are represented as the property of men, the property of the nation. Um, I spoke about that earlier when speaking about reproductive injustice and uh, speaking about abortion rights. And I think we need to expand it as well to understand that one of the symptoms, one of the materialization of the um, the appropriation of women's bodies is that in armed conflict, they will be the first victims of violence. Um, and what we need to understand as well is that rape, uh, in, it, there's a lot of um, literature on this, a lot of research on what rape, me rape means and how to, to, to understand rape. There are so many different uh, forms of rape, so many different forms of sexualized violence. And sexual violence in armed conflict um, is a fight that is taking place between men at another level, right? So it means that by attacking women and girls and elderly women, what the what the, the 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 rapists want to do, the mass rapists want to do, is to harm a nation. It's to harm the men to whom they think those bodies belong, right? So it means that it's not a crime that is primarily directed at the women, even if of course they are the primary victims and they feel this harm and this pain in their bodies, but symbolically that's a triangle that is taking place between men. So we're speaking about patriarchal power here. We're speaking about uh, asserting patriarchal power through the bodies of women, through female bodies. And this is what we really truly need to understand because if we do that, we need that we, we, we understand that we need to expand um, the fight against sexualized violence in conflict to other areas of feminist thinking, of feminist uh, struggles. And also, um, just to add to what Amelia was saying, um, we actually have seen racism against black students, black people trying to get onto trains to get out of Ukraine um, by Ukrainians. And then at the border in Poland or elsewhere, a similar racism, we don't want you. So, you know, again, to the point. Absolutely, and I uh, uh, we we have organized at the Center for Intersectional Justice a fundraiser to um, help um, Black people at the border who are unable to leave the country, who are facing extreme uh, cases of um, um, of violence, of racist violence. At the same time, uh, what we see is that uh, among the many many uh, hundreds of Ukrainians coming to Berlin uh, with a population that is highly engaged in trying, uh, highly committed in, in helping them uh, find refuge here. We also see that um, a lot of men are trying to come and abduct them and bring them into their rings of uh, human trafficking. So that's also something that needs to be understood that there are different level, la layers of vulnerability. At the same time, we see that um, men Ukrainian men above 18 also don't dispose of their bodies in times of war, right? So it means that capitalism and patriarchy are um, are very much entwined because in, in times of peace, they belong to the economy. In times of war, they belong to the army. So there's, I think that's why I was thinking about the overcoming of patriarchy as a win-win situation and not as a zero-sum game. And this illustrates it very well. Thank you very much. And um, hello, I'm Ethna. I'm studying. I'm studying the Enfil and Gender Studies here. I'm the class rep, um, and I just wanted to ask the panel if they think there's been a positive change in the representation of bodily diversity in mainstream media, or if we're still living in an era of what's tokenism, essentially. You mean positive in the sense that? Um... Uh, gender studies, or is, sorry, I didn't. Could you just um, repeat? Bodily diversity. Um, is there a, a has there been a, a positive change in the representation of bodily diversity in the mainstream media, or are we still living in an era of tokenism? Yeah, I, I, that's. It's an interesting question, and I don't know that I'm going to be terribly knowledgeable and skilled if I'm looking at the whole European. Um, level. I, I think we can say certainly here in Ireland, um, uh, there has been, uh, um, you know, more uh, visibility of, you know, um, head of RTE, um, a lot of women on Morning Ireland, other programs, um, and, and, and on other media. I think um, there has been a, a good movement forward, whether, um, whether in terms of content, 
um, you know, being able to actually raise the kind of issues we're talking about here. And that's another matter. Um, I, I don't think that's um, gone very far. Mm -hmm. Amelia, can you speak for more wider European? <laughs> yes, I can, of course. Uh, the short answer is yes, it has mainly remained at the level of tokenism. And we need to go beyond identities and individuals, because if we remain in a highly militarized state that that is, um, um, pref you know, preferring uh, patriarchal approaches to uh, foreign policy, for example, having more women uh, will definitely help, but it will not be enough. So we need to look at the policies and the, the ideologies and the, 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 the worldviews that are represented through people, right? It means that having uh, more Mm, we, we can take the UN as an example, and I think it's controversial here, but having more diversity doesn't necessarily undo colonial patterns within the United Nations, right? So it means we need to move beyond that. Diversity, yes, we need more representation. This is a fact, but we should not, we should not stop there. And um, I think that there's a lot of virtue signaling as well happening in this, saying, um, you know, using uh, events such as Diversity Week or today as well, you know, International Women's Day, a lot of uh, highly misogynist patriarchal institutions will use this opportunity to signal a certain virtue to perform some form of feminism and then the day ends and they will go back into their patriarchal thinking. Uh, and I say that quite unapologetically because um, we have to ask ourselves, what are these days and these international days of celebration made for? Are they really serving us? Are they really uh, advancing the fight that we're engaged in? And so that's what the, the question we need to ask. And if we have an intersectional approach to it, we can see that, um, for example, using International Women's Day to push the uh, flower industry, uh, which is a highly um, uh, exploitative uh, industry that is also uh, damaging the environment is not helpful, right? So um, yeah, we need to move beyond tokenism and virtue signaling. Thank you so much. Hi, um, I'm Karen from, I'm an applied languages student from the University of Limerick, um, and I'd love to know your perspectives on inclusive language. To what extent do you believe inclusive language has a role to play in achieving gender equality and equality overall? I think it's a really good question, and I'm sure Amelia will give a very good answer to this. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of in a learning curve um, where I'm learning all the time because I'm listening to uh, younger people. I'm listening on that podcast, Mothers of Invention. Um, I've, I've learned, you know, um, I, I don't describe myself as um, uh, uh, she and her. Or, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how I would go about that or why I would go, you know, it's, it's kind of, I'm learning. Um, but um, I, I do think that language itself is really very important. And um, the way we describe things, the way we talk about things. And I'm very taken with um, the way Amelia is bringing us back to the basics of um, how we um, address the structures in our world. And, the, and that's all um, to do with how we describe and how we use language. And um, so, uh, it is extremely important, and I'm in a learning curve myself because I come from a, an era that, you know, I'm, I'm growing, I hope, a little bit each day on um, being more open um, to exactly how uh, we want to move forward. And I, um, I'm very comfortable in my skin in saying I'm a feminist, but I know that, um, you know, I, I need to listen more to especially younger uh, perspectives on this. Amelia? Thank you so much. Yeah, I think there's uh, definitely something we, you know, we grew up in our generation and I'm also, I see a difference and I see a generational gap sometimes with people who are much younger than me. And, um, and what I see is that I look up to them. And that's something that I find uh, quite encouraging because when I look at young people, when I look at younger generation, I feel extremely inspired by them. And it means that we're moving forward. Otherwise it wouldn't be the case. Uh, language is crucial. Language is car carries a lot of meaning. Language helps us feel seen, heard, and for example, uh, having words emerging from our language can help us make sense of our experience. It can help us understand that our experience, our individual experiences, are embedded in a collective experience. For example, the word sexual harassment was coined in the 70s, 
70s, I think, or even the 80s, I can't remember exactly, but it's not a word that always existed. And it was liberating for a lot of women to know that word. And so to a lower scale, such words such as mansplaining, or words um, such as um, you know microaggression were terms that tremendously helped a lot of people understand that what they were feeling, what they were experiencing were part of bigger phenomena, bigger systems. In that sense, I think we need to um, use language that is more inclusive. So that's why I was, uh, I am uh, trying in Germany to include or to, to broaden the term International Women's Day to International Anti-Patriarchy Day. Uh, so that we have more people included in this uh, in this category. I'm all for using women. I'm not at all a person that says, okay, gender um, should be eradicated and we should not be speaking about women or men because we do need these categories. I'm uh, happy to um, you know, call myself a woman and I see myself as a woman. Um, at the same time, of course, non-binary is part of my identity, but I, I feel that we need to have words that convey um, more expansion that convey that are less rigid that are more flexible because the problems that we're faced with are imminently complex so we need to adapt our language to it and it doesn't make it less graspable so there are those two elements the element of um, having um, linguistic evolution that helps us uh, include our in individual experiences and make them part of a whole. And the uh, Me Too movement has been extremely helpful in this regard. Me Too as of, I also, I'm experiencing something that millions of women have too. Therefore, we have to deal with a system, with a structural phenomenon. phenomenon, phenomenon. Um, and the second aspect is having language and words that um, include more people that are um, making sense of the diversity and the depth of our experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to draw events to a close now, and I'd like to thank Emilia Ruig and uh, Mary Robinson, our student delegates. Um, and Mary is going to, um, to close the event by reading a poem by, by the late and, and lamented Evan Boland. Yes, uh, I asked if I could just read this. Not, I'm not going to read the whole poem because it's quite a long poem. I'm going to read um, just part of it at the end of it. Um, but I read it especially for you, my provost. Um, I was part of letters to you to say, Ivan Boland has to have a center here in Trinity, has to be properly regarded, et cetera. But Ivan was commissioned by the UN mission in New York and the Royal Irish Academy um, to write a poem about the Irish suffragettes. You know, we've had the 100th anniversary. And um, I know that she didn't like initially the idea of commissioning, you know, it's not easy as a poet, but I think she rose beautifully to the occasion. She um, wrote a poem called, Our Future Will Become the Past of Other Women. And the version I have is illustrated by Paula McGloin. Um, it's beautifully done in all of the six languages of the UN. And it was, um, Ivan first read it in the General Assembly of the UN. Um, her father had actually been a diplomat and had been a president of the General Assembly, so there was a kind of connection. And then women in their different languages read out, um, not, not just in the six languages, but in, you know, they, 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 they did in many languages, so it kind of took on a life of its own. And I just want to read the last part of it. If we could only summon or see them, these women, foremothers of the nurture and dignity that will come to all of us from this day, we could say across the century, to each one, give me your hand. It has written our future. Our future will become the past of other women. And I love that, that sense of, and I think, you know, I, I say it really to you young people, and I join Amelia in this, you give me hope. Um, you know, um, we need an urgency of now, you know, um, that kind of urgency of now that um, was spoken about by Mar Martin Luther King, um, the, the terrible urgency of now um, to uh, understand the world we're in in the broader sense, aggravated now by the terrible uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, it is the moment when we can hope for and work for the radical change that we need in our world. It's been a pleasure to be back in Trinity. It's been a pleasure in particular to talk with both uh, Amelia and Laura. I regret we couldn't be physically together, but let's, let's stay in touch. And um, uh, thank you very much um, for your um, initiative, uh, the Goethe Institute, the, um, 
uh, French embassy, the German embassy, and in particular, the Center for Gender here, and um, you yourself. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you to us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.